We've been looking at a series called Pictures of Faith. And through this series, we've been looking at different stories throughout the, the Bible about what does faith look like? Really examining these characters like Abraham, we looked at Rahab, and even last week we looked at King David. And if you didn't get a chance to hear that sermon last week uh, that Nathan preached, it was a great sermon. It was a wonderful sermon uh, about David losing his son and his faith to trust the Lord that he would see his son in heaven. And so I encourage you, take time this week to, to listen to that sermon. You'll be blessed for listening to it. And so today we're going to continue uh, looking through these pictures, and we're going to look specifically at the Seraphonician woman. And it's a story that many of you have probably read before. And so now we're going to turn to Matthew 15, look at verses 21 to 28. And so if you will, please stand for the reading of God's Word. It says this, Jesus went from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Please remain standing as we pray and ask God to bless our time. Father, thank you for your word. You are a gracious, good, heavenly father to us. Lord, you are our master. And I ask that you bless this time. Open our hearts to your word this morning. Make us hear it. Make us respond to it. And bless these words, Lord. Make them uh, glorified in our hearts and our minds this morning. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, looking at this picture, this is a unique picture that we haven't seen yet in our series. And it's not because of the woman's faith that makes this unique, but it's because of the response that Jesus gives in this picture that's unique to us this morning. We don't know much about this woman. Scripture doesn't even give us her name. But from what we can observe from this passage, there are a couple of elements that are like the other pictures that we've looked at. First, this woman comes with a tremendous burden. We learn that her daughter is possessed by a demon. Sickness is one thing, but being under the hand of Satan is a terrible fate. And yet this woman comes to Christ with a burden that is beyond physical help, and yet is physically destructive. Satan does nothing but steal, kill, and destroy. And this girl must have been in a great distress. So her mother does what any mother would do. She looks for help. And so this woman calls out to Jesus. We learn that immediately she brings her request to Jesus. And we learn this in the Gospel of Mark. Mark tells us that the, the woman immediately, when she heard about Jesus, when she heard that he was in the region, she gets up and she goes to Jesus. And finally, this woman calls him Lord and the son of David. The scripture says she's a Canaanite woman. And in Mark, it says she's a Syrophoenician woman. This doesn't contradict. The Syrophoenicians were a part of Syria that belonged to this area, to this general region. Now, this woman calling Christ the son of David is not unique to this story. We saw Bartimaeus do this, right? When he calls out, Jesus have mercy on me, son of David. But it's striking because she's not a Jew. She's a Syrophoenician woman. And so why is this striking? Well, this woman calls out to Jesus and says, Son of David. And this was a title that was for a Jew. That a Jew would look to the coming Messiah, 
the promised one to the household of David, the one that would save Israel and redeem them from their sin and bring about the new kingdom. That's what this title meant. They were looking to an, the, the heir of King David himself to come and restore uh, Israel to Christ or to, to himself. And so the Jews were looking forward to the son of David, that he would come and restore them. And if you've read the Old Testament, you know that none of David's sons actually do this. None of them are worthy to, to restore Israel to, to God. They all fall short of doing this. And so none of them accomplish this. And so, so the son of David was the Messiah that was to come. And so to hear this from a non-Jewish woman was strange. And it's not what we would expect in this passage. In addition, the Apostle Peter hasn't even called Christ by his true name yet. He won't do that until the next chapter. So the fact that this woman calls Jesus the son of David and is crying out for mercy tells us that she has faith in who he is. Then we are confirmed when Jesus commends her faith at the end of the passage. Now how did she know to call him by this title? Scripture doesn't tell us. We do have a story we've looked at before in Rahab. A few weeks ago, we went over her picture of faith. And it's similar to this one, right? We have a non-Israelite woman, an unlikely character, and someone who we are surprised by when she pulls the spies in and tells them why they should save her. As she looks to the God of Israel for salvation. And so maybe she's heard of the deeds, his healings, his casting out of demons, and decided to take a risk and go to Christ. And so we're not told, but we know that God always has plans for those whom he loves. God was not unaware of her needs and her burdens. God is personally involved in his creation and is not distant, especially from those whom he loves. And so as we look at this story this morning, we would expect Jesus to do what Jesus does. We would expect Jesus to look upon this woman, hear her plea, and grant her request, wouldn't we? And in, in fact, we've seen this before in Bartimaeus. He cried out, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus turns around and he shows him mercy. He heals them. This is what we would expect this morning. And perhaps, maybe even more so, because this woman's not coming just for herself, right? This woman's coming for her daughter. This woman is, is coming on behalf of someone else who's burdened. And not just looking to save herself. However, Jesus says nothing to her. Verse 23 says, but he did not answer her a word. Can you imagine hearing nothing from Jesus? Can you imagine going to Christ with this great burden and hearing silence? I imagine some of you can this morning. There are some of you who have been taking your request to Jesus for months or years and have heard nothing. You've been praying for children who have walked away from the Lord. You are praying for victory over certain sins in your life. You're praying for healing or for, the fam for your family to give their life to Jesus. This may be you right here this morning, feeling as if Jesus doesn't hear you. And if this is you this morning, then this picture is for you today. And so this is a glorious picture of what faith does in the face of no. And before we talk about what faith does in the face of no, 
I want to say at the beginning a little bit about what faith is. And we'll start with what faith is not. A couple of things. First, faith is not living through rose-colored glasses or looking at the world through a glass half full kind of mentality, right? Many people believe that faith is weak, that it's a crutch. They see faith as a tool to cope with harsh realities in their life and to deal with the hard things. But this is not biblical faith. Biblical faith is not looking at the world through a lens, through rose-colored color lenses, as if everything is, is just going to work itself out. This is baseless. It's like chaff in the wind, an impersonal force, a fantasy, rather than the personal God who is real and who loves you. Second, faith is not a fast pass for suffering. I recently had an opportunity to go to Cedar Point, and I'm not one for roller coasters, but I went to celebrate Pastor David, and it was a great time. I loved it. You know, I love getting on. I hate the wait, the anticipation, right? But I love it when I get on. You know, it's the thrill of death and joy kind of mixed together as if, man, this could be it, right? Especially on that climb. So, but you know, you're waiting in line, and you're waiting in line at times 30, 40 minutes, maybe longer, right, if it's a ride you really want. And then you look over to the left, and there's kind of this empty set of lines, and you're wondering why you're not in those lines, you know? Like, why isn't that going today? It's hot, 50-minute wait. But that's the fast pass line, right? That's the line that you wish you were in. That was the line you said no to paying the extra 100, 150 bucks to get on the ride quicker. You said, nah, it'll be fine. And then you see some people run through those lines, and you're like, wow, this isn't so bad. You know, like, they're, they're zipping up. They're on the ride, and you're still waiting. And sometimes, and this happened, right? This, you know, sometimes you're waiting, and you see those same people go through that line again on the second time, and you're still, you haven't even got on the ride once. And I think at times we think faith just means, man, we're done suffering for today. There's, there's not going to be suffering. It's all fast past life from here. But this isn't faith. Faith is not a fast pass. There are times when we see God answer our prayers immediately. And there are times, however, when we are on our knees praying for days, for months, and years without ever hearing anything from God. It's Paul who in 2 Corinthians says that he prayed three times for the Lord to remove a thorn from him. But the Lord didn't. And in fact says, my grace is sufficient for you. And so faith does not remove pains from our life. It's not magic that bends the will of God to our will. And so what is faith? Faith is all in on Jesus. And, thr- and it's trusting in the substance of his word and his character. Faith rests on content. It's not magic or empty, vague words that make us feel better. The Bible is not just to make us feel better. It's true. Faith looks to the living God and his promises. And so the true object of our faith is not faith itself, but it's the true object of our faith is God himself. The object of our faith is not faith itself. It's, it's God himself and his word. Faith does not rest on my circumstances. In other words, it's not our requests. It's not that the disasters happening in my life or our understanding. God uses these things. He uses these circumstances maybe to draw us closer to him at times. But that's not what our faith is focused on. Our faith is found in God rather than these circumstances. Faith is turned toward the person and work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews says this, And without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. 
Faith is rooted in God and his promises. That even in the face of no, God is a rewarder of those who seek him. And so the object of our faith must be the sovereign God of the Bible who loves us and who gave himself for us. When the object of our faith is the circumstances of our life, rather than Christ, we die. We will become angry, bitter, and we will even turn away from him. On the other hand, if Christ is the object of our faith, then even as we hear no or nothing at all, then we will continue to throw ourselves at God who has the power to change our circumstances. And we know that he is a rewarder of those who seeks him. Now, I'm not going to say that God will give you a Mercedes Benz or a vacation home because you asked in faith. No, faith aligns our minds with God. Jesus says earlier in Matthew 6, that we are first to seek him and his kingdom and his righteousness and that he will add all these things to us. And these things refers to our home, our food, our clothing, even the desires of our heart. And he gives generously. And so to sum this portion up, faith is not a weakness, nor is it looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Faith isn't a fast pass from suffering. And faith doesn't rest on circumstances. But faith turns to the person and the work of Jesus Christ for hope. Now, with this in our mind, let us look at our passage. Looking at the passage, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus was not going, he wasn't withdrawing for a little R&R or a little retreat. He wasn't just needing some me time. There were times that Jesus did get away to go and pray, but this was not one of those times. Jesus lived his life with a purpose. And therefore, the purpose of Jesus going to this region was not for a retreat, but to do the will of his Father. Now, I start here because later in the passage, Jesus says in verse 24 that he was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The problem is, the region of Tyre and Sidon was not a Jewish region. This was not an area where you would see many Jews, if you saw any at all. Maybe some were passing by or traveling through, but this is not an area in which many Jews lived. In addition to this, Jesus going to this region is just kind of out of the way. It's not close. It was about 40 miles or so from where he was and where he departed. It would have been like walking from here to Cedar Point and stopping at Marblehead. There would have been many other places for Jesus to retreat if he just was getting away. If he just was going to rest from ministry or just get out of Dodge. And so Jesus was not looking for a retreat, but he had great purpose for going here. And his purpose was for this moment right here. His purpose for going out here was to meet this woman. And this isn't the first time that we have seen Jesus do this. In fact, in the the Gospel of John, John tells us that Jesus had to go through the area of Samaria on his way home to Galilee. That he had to go. And why did he have to go? Well, if you know, he had to go to meet the woman at the well. There, he stops the well of Jacob, and there's a woman there, and he has this dialogue with her. And of course, you know that she ends up turning to Christ and telling the whole village who this man is, who told her all that, she, that he knew. And so we know that Jesus lives a life on purpose, and that purpose is to fulfill his Father's will. And so Jesus understood that the Father had all nations in his sight. And we, this isn't something that's just in the New Testament, but we see that the Father has always had all nations. You know, the the Canaanites, the Syrophoenician, he wasn't just going to the house of Israel for the Jews. We see in Genesis 12, in the, the great call of Abraham, that 
that God said that all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And again, in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah says, but there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with content. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And this is a dark land. This wasn't the land of the Jews. This was the land of the Gentiles. This was a Gentile woman. She was in darkness, and yet the light came to her. And in fact, all of Matthew, Matthew sets up Christ as fulfilling the promises of God, the prophecies of God from the Old Testament. And so Jesus fulfills this by going to the dark land because he was the light that shined on them. And so Jesus came first to the house of Israel, but he was also coming for the nations. And we see this in the New Testament. Even before we get to this story, we we see that Jesus went to the other side of the lake of the Gerasenes to heal a man who had many demons in him, a legion of demons. And later on in his ministry, we see that Jesus heals the daughter of a Roman centurion just by saying his word. Again, before he meets this woman, he's already healed some who are not, Gen- or are not Jews, but he's healed Gentiles before. Both the Old and the New Testament demonstrates that the purpose of God's salvation was not just for the Jews, but was for all the nations to be blessed through Jesus, its king. And so my point in bringing this to our attention is the fact that faith expects things from God. It expects things from God because of who he is and because of his word. This woman understood she wasn't a Jew. She wasn't crazy. She knew she wasn't a Jew. And if she understood that she wasn't a Jew but, and had enough sense to, to call Jesus the Son of God, then she knew that the promises were first for the Jews and then the nation. But she must have had and known something more about God than what this passage tells us. And in fact, the passage does tell us that he was merciful. This woman didn't bind her hands because she was not a lost child of Israel. She didn't pout around. She didn't say, woe is me. If only I was born in the house of Abraham. She goes to him anyway. We are not God. We do not know all the plans he has made. And this is important because her faith wasn't based upon her circumstances. It would be easy to look at this moment and say, well, she went because of her daughter. And although that may be what motivated her, she's looking straight ahead to the mercy of Jesus, the son of David. She's looking to God and she's expecting something from him, right? She's expecting him to heal her her daughter. She's expecting God to work on her behalf. Because faith forces us to deal with God. Faith expects things from God because of who he is and what he has said. It clings to God and his promises rather than the circumstances of life. The circumstances surrounding her daughter may have been used But she was forced to deal with Jesus himself. This woman didn't know that Jesus made this trip for her. But she did come away anyway. She did come anyway. She did go to him. She didn't know. But she expected everything from him. She didn't know all the scripture. She wasn't born a Jew. She looked to Christ alone to show her mercy And many many of us need to learn not to decide for God. Scripture tells us a lot about God's will. It lays out quite a bit about salvation and what he wants. But it doesn't lay out his entire will to us. And yet we take and we make decisions for him, whether it's about family members or the ones we love, don't we? We stop praying for them. 
We stop talking to them about Jesus. We kind of throw our hands up as if, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Instead of believing that he is a rewarder of those who seek him, like this woman, she was expecting something from Jesus. And we have his word. We have all of it before us. And we know he's merciful. If you've tasted him today, you know. You believe in faith like Caleb today. You know he's merciful to you. Now, we have looked at why Jesus comes to this area. So let's turn our attention then to the interaction between Christ and this woman. And so she comes immediately to Jesus upon hearing about his arrival. She calls him Lord, son of David. And her cause for coming is real. However, Jesus doesn't say anything to her. And if it wasn't bad enough that Jesus says nothing, he does say this. He says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which is even worse. It's not just nothing. He says, no. It's not only silence. It's in fact, no. And at this point, the disciples chime in. They ask Jesus to answer her and give her what she wants. Not out of the kindness of their heart, right? But by this point, she's crying out. (laughs) And the disciples speak up and say, can you make this woman go away? And we know that the disciples are asking Jesus to just give her what she wants because of the way he responds to them. To them. For he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you wonder what's going on in the disciples' minds at this point. Because they know Jesus. They know that he's done great things for those outside the house of faith. They knew about the centurion. They knew about the woman at the well and the man with many demons. And so hearing Jesus say no must have shaken them as it does many of us. This isn't the Jesus we are used to, the gentle and lowly Jesus, and especially to a woman with this kind of need. We expect Jesus to heal her right there, right then when she came. But he says no. And we hate hearing no. We hate the word. We hate what it means. It means rejection in the short term, but even possible rejection in the long term. It means that someone else has power over us. And we see that Christ doesn't even do what the disciples request for this woman. It's startling. Jesus does what Jesus wants. And at times, we don't rejoice in this. Because in our sin, we believe that if we do everything right, that if we have a cleanish track record, that we're going to church and saying our prayers, that Jesus will do what we want him to do. But this isn't true. Jesus doesn't bend to the emotional manipulation of you and me. He is not bound to do us good simply because we have done him good. He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and he owes us nothing, and we owe him everything. And even after hearing no, this woman keeps coming to Christ. And now she's thrown herself at his feet, and she's worshiping him. And at this point, maybe Jesus will reveal to us, right, that he's just testing her. But he doesn't. Instead, he says with more bite, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. For the third time, he says no. And this time, he even calls her a dog. What a painful moment. Hearing nothing from Jesus is heavy enough for anyone. But heavier still is the affliction of a harsh, cutting reply, such as this. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. 
But we must understand that Jesus is the sovereign king with authority to do as he pleases. It's his will be done, not ours. We love our authority and control, and we want to control the things in our life, especially when it involves those whom we love. And it's in times like these that know that I think we begin to reject God as our king. He must not be for me. He must not want to do this for me, so I will do something about it myself. I'll go about it myself. I'll stop. I'm just going to push on without him. When it seems like God is silent, or we hear no, we reject him as our king, and we attack him. Can God really change the heart of my son? It's been years since since I've been praying for my son, and it seems only that he's falling away more and more each day rather than drawing closer to God. Doesn't God care? And if you don't do this, if you're like, well, I don't do this, that's not me. Have you ever reduced it, reduced God's sovereignty and to something that's manageable, something palatable, something that's like, well, it's not so bad. At least I have a good relationship with them. At least they're still in my life. God did what he could. We reject God's sovereignty, and we make ourselves out to be God. And at the heart of this problem is our pride. We hate that God can do what he wants, and we can't. We are afraid that his no is actually no, and we don't want to hear it. We make God out to be a harsh master who doesn't do us good, but rather seeks to make our life worse. Our pride attacks God and his character, and we reject his word. We make our circumstances the end, of all, end all rather than God. It's easy to fixate on this problem, the problems in our life, right? It's easy. It's what we see. It's what we're in. It's the moment. It's the feeling. We can fixate on the things we want, the things that we're bringing to Jesus as if like, Lord, do you hear me? We make the circumstances of our life everything. And when we don't hear him or we think he's saying no, we reject him. And we start a spiral downward. We fixate, we worry, and we become bitter and angry toward God. And when the circumstances of our life become God, it's death. This isn't faith. It's faithlessness and sin when we think these things. God, however, is a sovereign king, and he does love us, and he gave his son up for us. He's not a harsh master. He doesn't meet us halfway. Instead, he does give us good gifts. He does bless those who wrestle with him. God is a good father who loves us. And so maybe you're, you're, you're asking, well, Jake, I, I feel like I am making Christ the center of my life. Maybe he is the object of your life, the object of your faith, and you, you're still sitting there hearing no or silence. And there are times when God does make those whom he loves wait. There are times when God does allow us to suffer for our good. We know that Job was one that God took everything away. And yet God loved Job. And Job was a righteous man. Even King David last week, Nathan preached that he prayed for days over the state of his son, asking God to save his son. But it was not given his request. And instead of turning away from God, God was the one he turned to. And of course, there's Jesus who suffered on behalf of all of us. 
And he did so, the scripture says, with the joy set before him. He was not excused from suffering. But as the scriptures say, it was through his suffering that his faith was perfected. God, therefore, does not stay silent at times for the benefit. God, therefore, does stay silent at times for the benefit of you. He knows your every need as a good father. He knows what is good for you and gives you as he so pleases. He's not like our, earth, our earthly fathers who, who often do give in to our manipulation, but he is a good father who loves you enough to say no. And so, uh, to illustrate, I, I, remember I grew up, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Uh, I have my mom and dad who love me very much. And there was a time in high school where I wanted to go on spring break with this girl that I was dating. So I went and I asked my mother, and she said, well, you need to ask your father. And so I did, and I thought at that point, man, this is a shoe in I'm going to get to go on this, this spring break trip with this girl that I'm very interested in. And so I go and I ask my dad, and I'm expecting him to say, oh, yeah, that'll be great. Have fun. But to my surprise, my dad said no. And I was angry. I was very upset at him. I was proud. And I look back at that time in my life, and I believe that my father's no in that moment saved my life from a terrible life. No doesn't mean unloved. It is often those who tell you no that love you the most. Do not for a second believe the lies of Satan. When God may be silent in your life right now, Satan speaks, and he speaks loudly. Do not for one second believe that God loves you any less. He is a good father to you, and he loves you, and he gave his son for you, and he does hear you. Jesus does respond to this woman even in this passage. Second, I want to say faith is humble. So faith in the face of no is humble. And I want to call us, as I close, to look at the humility of this woman. She's a great woman. She doesn't give up. She persists even in the face of no. She looks to Christ alone for mercy, saying, have mercy on me, son of David, have mercy. And even when Jesus tells her that the bread was for the children, not for the dogs, she doesn't buck. She doesn't prickle up and begin accusing Jesus of not being who she thought he was. She doesn't puff up and argue with Jesus. She doesn't argue, well, who's the, the true children of Israel? <laughs> she doesn't say a word against him. She admits what he says is true. She really is a dog under the master's table. Israel really are the children who sit above her and the ones who were the first to receive the blessing. But she understood that it's better to be a dog in the house of God under the table receiving even the crumbs of mercy than to be outside. This should remind us of the prodigal son who after blowing everything his father gave him, rejecting his father, spending it all, he finds himself in the pigsties, reasoning with himself, saying, even the servants in my father's house are eating better than me. And so he goes back to his father, ready to be just a servant, maybe even a dog. He understood that it was better to be in his father's house than with the pigs, 
And this is a profound truth about faith, and we can't miss it. The object of faith is Christ alone, but the posture of faith is humility. Humility is not weakness, it is power. It was the humility of this woman that persists to ask the king of kings. Even in the face of no, she is humble, not puffed up. Even in the face of no, she doesn't doubt the truth about Christ, that he alone had the power to save his daughter, her daughter. But instead, her humility keeps her asking. She persists in asking Jesus for help to change her daughter, to remove the demons. He was the object of her faith, and her humility to persist kept her before Christ. Jesus could have cast her out. He could have been done with her. Kind of like in the story of Esther, right? Like the king could have, you know, just pointed down his scepter and she would have been out. But wildly, this foreigner goes before the king of kings and she's not cast out. But she walks away a princess and a watching world, to a watching world. So often we give up going to Jesus because we are proud. We stop asking for God to change the heart of our family member. Or we settle for halfway promises. Well, it's kind of there. It's good enough. But faith is not proud. Faith throws itself onto the promises of God and expects great things from God. It lets God make the decision because he is a good father who loves us and he is the sovereign king to do something about it. The object of our faith must be this God, the sovereign God of the Bible who loves us and who gave himself for us. It cannot be the outcome of these things that we worship or that we set our our hope on. That will only lead to death. That will only lead to bitterness, misery. If all we want is the, the outcomes, if that is what we have our faith in, we will die on the vine. But if our faith is in God and his word, then even in the face of no, we can have hope that there will be fruit And there will be life. Let us pray.